Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. It's a real pleasure and honor. I've been to Indiana before, but my first time here in Upland and at Taylor. So thank you all very much for having me. I'm going to start by giving you just a little bit of background on myself so you'll understand where I'm coming from and why I've done what I've done. First of all, I just turned 63 years of age last month. Thank you. But I was, I was born in Chicago, not too far from here, right? And as a child, I was a child of parents in the U.S. Foreign Service. So I grew up during my formative years all over the world. My dad was a U.S. Foreign Service. I was an American embassy brat. And so you go to a country, you're there for two years, come back home, you're here for a few months, and then to another country for two years. Back and forth, back and forth. Between traveling with my folks as a kid, and now I went to Howard University in Washington, D.C., where I got my degree in music, and now I'm a professional musician, also touring around the world and around this country. When you combine my childhood travels with my adulthood travels, I've now been to 57 countries on six continents. Now, all, all that is to say is that I have been exposed to a multitude of cultures, skin colors, ethnicities, col uh, beliefs, ideologies, religions, all of that. And all of that has helped shape who I've become. And I can tell you something. When I get home, no matter how far I've gone from our country right here, the US, whether it's right next door to Canada or to Mexico or halfway around the globe, no matter how different people may be who I encounter who don't look like me, who don't speak my language, or worship as I do, or, or practice my culture, or believe the things in which I believe. When I get back home, I always conclude one thing, and that is that we all are human beings. And as such, we all want the same basic five things in our lives. We all want to be loved. We all want to be respected. We all want to be heard and we all want to be treated fairly, and we all want the same things for our family as anybody else wants for their family. And if we can remember to employ those five core values in whatever society, in whatever culture we may find ourselves one day in which we are unfamiliar, if we employ those five core values, I will guarantee each and every one of you that your navigation in that culture or that society would be a lot smoother and a lot more positive. Now, when I was overseas in the early 1960s, I started traveling at the age of three in 1961. My, uh, my first exposure to school, uh, kindergarten, first grade, third grade, fifth grade, like every two years, right, uh, was overseas. My classes were filled with kids from all over the world. My classmates were Nigerian, French, Italian, German, Australian, Swedish, you name it, Japanese. If they had an embassy in those countries, all of their children went to the same school. If you were to open the door to my classroom, put your head in and look, you would say, this looks like a United Nations of little kids, because that's exactly what it was. <laughs> and so <clears throat> that being my first exposure to school, that was my baseline. That's all I knew. Uh, I did not know that wasn't the norm back here, right? And so when I would come back home, I would either be in all black schools or black and white schools, meaning the still segregated or the newly integrated. Even though desegregation was passed by the, by the Supreme Court in 1954, it wasn't like switching a light switch and everything just changed overnight, no. It took years and years for schools to become integrated. So one of the times, you know, and I, when I would come back home, you know, I, I was not exposed to the diversity that I had overseas. Well, one of the times I came back, I was age 10, 1968, and I was in Massachusetts. I was one of two black kids in the entire school, myself in fourth grade and a little uh, black girl in second grade. So I didn't see a whole lot of her. Uh, you know, because I, you know, being a big bad fourth grader, I didn't associate with second graders, right? So all of my friends consequently were fourth and fifth graders. And naturally, they all were white. Some, <clears throat> excuse me, some of my guy friends were members of the Cub Scouts. And they invited me to join. So I joined the Cub Scouts, had a great time. 
We had a parade one day, along with the Girl Scouts, Brownies, Cub Scouts, Boy Scouts, 4-H Club, and different organizations. And the, the streets were lined, or the sidewalks, I should say, the sidewalks were lined with nothing but white people, and the streets were blocked off for, for this parade. And people are waving and cheering and having a good old time, and I'm having a good time. I was the only black participant in this parade. We got to a certain point in the parade route, and suddenly I'm getting hit with bottles and soda pop cans and small rocks and just general debris from the street by a small group of spectators off to my right. I remember it being a couple kids, maybe a year or two older than me, and a couple of adults who were throwing things. Because I had never experienced this before, my first thought was, oh, these people over here, they don't like the scouts. That's how naive I was. I didn't realize I was the only scout getting hit until my den mother, my cub master, my troop leader all came running over and huddled over me with their own bodies and escorted me out of the danger. Now I'm baffled. What had I done to cause them to, to attack me like this? You know, I, I'm trying to, to justify why they're doing it. You know, you know, did I do something wrong? You know, what was up? And I kept asking them, well, you know, why, why are they doing this? Why are they doing this? Because I was the only one getting this special protection. And all they would do is shush me and rush me along, telling me everything was going to be OK. Well, they never answered the question. At the end of the parade, parade's over, I go on home. My mom and dad, who were not at the parade, they're putting Band-Aids on me and cleaning me up and asking me, how did you fall down and get all scraped up? I told them I didn't fall down. I told them exactly what had happened. For the first time in my life, my mom and dad sat me down and explained to me what racism was. Now, believe it or not, at the age of 10, I had never heard the word racism. I had no clue what they were talking about. My 10-year-old brain could not process what they were telling me that just because of the color of my skin, there, there would be people out there who had never seen me before, who had never spoken to me, who knew absolutely nothing about me, who would want to inflict pain upon me for no other reason than this. It made no sense. And I, didn't, I did not believe my parents for the first time in my life. You know, I, I didn't have big brothers and sisters to learn things from. I'm an only child. My folks got it right the first time. So, <laughs> you know, I, I always believed my folks. If I had a problem or, you know, or a question, my mom and dad gave me the answer or gave me the solution or gave me the tools by which I could derive the answer or solution. But when they were telling me this, for the first time in my life, I did not believe them. And it just made no sense to me. And the people on the sidewalk did not look any different to me than my friends in my school right there or my friends overseas, whether they were there, my little French friends or Swedish friends or Australian friends. So color had nothing to do with it. My, I don't know why my parents were telling me this. Well, about a month and a half later, that same year, 1968, on April the 4th, Martin Luther King was assassinated. And I remember it very well. Every major city in this country burned to the ground with violence and destruction, all in the name of this new word that I had learned called racism. So now I understood that my parents had not lied to me, that this thing, this phenomenon does exist. I accepted that, but I didn't know why. Why do people hate one another? And I formed a question in my mind at that age, which was, how can you hate me when you don't even know me? And for the next 53 years, I've been looking for the answer to that question. I bought books on black supremacy, white supremacy, the Ku Klux Klan, uh, the Nazis in Germany, the neo-Nazis over here, anti-Semitism, you name it, I've got a vast library about it. And I've read all those books. All those books talked about it, but they didn't tell me why. So I, I'm still looking for that answer. And I'd ask people, oh, Daryl, you know, some people are just like that. You know, I don't know why, you know, that's just, just, just how it is. Well, that was not good enough for me. So I had to find out, well, who better to go to to get the answer to your question, how can you hate me when you don't even know me? So as an adult, I decided I'm going to ask the Ku Klux Klan, 
who better to go to than someone who would go so far as to join an organization that practices hating people who don't look like them or who don't believe as in what they believe. So that's how I started to do this. Now, I'm gonna tell you about this one guy. Uh, I decided I would start in Maryland. I live in Maryland right now, about 15 minutes outside of Washington, D.C. So I decided I'm gonna start in Maryland and then travel around the country interviewing different grand dragons and imperial wizards and other leaders and members and write a book about it. So the, uh, the leader in Maryland at the time was named Roger Kelly. And I decided I want to interview him. I had my secretary give him a call. And I, I got his information from somebody who knew him, who told me, Daryl, do not fool with Roger Kelly. Roger Kelly will kill you. And this guy was very concerned about my safety. And I said, well, that's the whole reason I need to see Mr. Kelly. Why would he kill me just because I'm black? You know, this, I don't understand this. I need him to tell me why. And so he says, just please don't fool with him. And he begged and pleaded with me not to give Mr. Kelly um, his name, where I got his information, his personal phone number and uh, address. I said, okay. So I had my secretary give Mr. Kelly a call, and uh, I said, don't tell him that I'm black. Just tell him that your boss wants to interview him. He's writing a book on the Klan. Would he consent to sitting down and giving uh, me an interview? Now, my secretary is white. Uh, I don't mention that because it doesn't matter to me. I mention it because it's part of the story. I didn't want to call Mr. Kelly myself, even though I had the number. I figured he might detect in my voice you know, that I'm black and say, I'm not talking to you, click, and hang up the phone, and then my whole project would have ended before it ever got started. But I knew that if Mary, my secretary, called him, he would know by her voice that she's black, I mean, that she's white, and he would not automatically assume that this white woman was working for a black man, especially a black man who's writing a book on the Klan, because they didn't exist. Mine was the first. So she called him, and I told her, don't tell him that I'm black unless he asks. And so he didn't ask, and we set it up at 5.15 in a motel room. So Mary and I got there super early. And I, sent, I gave Mary some money, sent her down the hall to get soda pop out of the machine, put it in the ice bucket, get it nice and cold, so I'd be able to offer my guest a, a cold beverage when he arrived. I had no idea what this man was gonna do. Would he look at me and say, I'm not talking to you, and walk away? Would he attack me, or would he come in my room and sit down and interview? So, but in, in any event, I was gonna be hospitable and offer him a cold beverage. So we got all that set up. Now, the way the room just happened to be in this motel, if you people are standing in the doorway of the motel, in the hall, looking through the door, you cannot see who's in the room. You have to walk in the room, turn to your right, and the room is laid out back here. So you gotta go around the corner. I took the lamp table, threw the lamp off, put the table over here in the most obscure corner of the room, put a chair on one side for Mr. Kelly, a chair on this side for me. And I had a cassette recorder, which I set in the middle of the table. I had a copy of the Bible, because the Ku Klux Klan claims to be a Christian organization. And they claim that the Bible preaches racial separation. Now, in my reading of the Bible, I've never seen that. So I want to be able to pull out my Bible and say, here, Mr. Kelly, please, show me chapter and verse where it says blacks and whites must be separate. So I'm all prepared. I had blanket sets in there as well. Well, right on time, there's a knock on the door. Mary hops up, runs around the corner, opens the door. In walks the bodyguard. He's wearing military camouflage, the Ku Klux Klan insignia, which is a red circle with a white cross and a red blood drop in the center of the cross, patch over here, the letters KKK right here, and embroidered on his cap, it said Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. And right here, he had a semi-automatic handgun in a holster. He comes in, Mr. Kelly is walking directly behind him in a dark blue suit and tie. The bodyguard turned the corner and saw me and just froze. Well, Mr. Kelly did not realize that his bodyguard had stopped short. So Mr. Kelly slammed into the guy and knocked him forward. And now they both are stumbling around trying to regain their balance, you know, looking all around the room. And I'm just sitting there like, you know, looking at them. And I could read their faces like a billboard. You know, their faces were saying, did the desk clerk give us the wrong room number or is this an ambush? So I realized the apprehension. I stood up and I went like this to show I had nothing in my hands. And I walked forward. I said, hi, Mr. Kelly, I'm Daryl Davis. He shook my hand, and the bodyguard shook my hand. I said, please, come on in, please, have a seat, have a seat. Mr. Kelly sat down. 
And before I could sit down opposite him, he asked for my, for my identification. The bodyguard stood at attention to his right. I gave Mr. Kelly my driver's license. He says, oh, you live on such and such street in Silver Spring. Now that had me concerned. Why is he notating my address? Is he gonna come burn a cross on my lawn? Or you know, what's going on here? All he needs to do is look at my picture, look at my name, look at me, match it up, and give me back my license. Here he is calling off my street and all that. So that had me a little concerned. I did not want to let him know that I was concerned, but I wanted him to know that he was not welcome to, to just come and visit my house, you know, un, uninvited for any nefarious reasons. So I said to him, I said, yes, Mr. Kelly, that is where I live. And then I named his house number and his street. <laughs> so I'm leveling the playing field, right? So I'm implying, you know, if you come visit me, I'm gonna come visit you. And we're gonna, you know, so maybe we should confine all this visiting to this motel room. Well, he smiled, he nodded his head, he understood. I didn't realize it that day, but I had no reason, I was being presumptuous, I had no reason to fear Mr. Kelly coming to my house to do anything stupid. One of his members, I didn't know it at the time, one of his members lived right down the road from me, I didn't know that. And Mr. Kelly would have to travel down my street to get to that guy's house, which was in the next neighborhood over. My street runs through both neighborhoods. So I didn't know that, and it was just pure coincidence he recognized the street, that's all. And today, that same Klan member sits in a federal prison for committing a hate crime. So he, he's there for a long time. So anyway, we got on with this interview, and um, every time my cassette you know, ran out of tape, I'd reach down to, you know, to pull out a, a fresh cassette or if Mr. Kelly said, Mr. Davis, the Bible says, I reached down to pull out my Bible and hand it to him. Every time I reached down like this, the bodyguard reached up like this. And you know, he never pulled the gun, but he put his hand on, on the butt of the gun. And I understood that that's his job. You know, he doesn't know what's in my bag. He doesn't know me. So he's protecting his boss. Well, after a little while, he got over all that and I went in and out of the bag, he didn't move. You know, he figured, you know, there's no threat in here. He was cool, so he relaxed. Well, Mr. Kelly and I just talking casually, and then, you know, maybe about an hour or so had passed, all of a sudden there's like a quick, short noise that came out of nowhere, like a that was it. And we all jumped. And I knew that Mr. Kelly had made this noise. I didn't know what the noise was, and because I, it was so short and so fast, my ear could not discern what it was, I perceived it to be a threatening noise, an ominous noise, because it came out of nowhere. And I knew that he made it. How did I know that? Because I didn't make it. So if I didn't make it, I'm gonna blame him. <laughs> and, you know, that's natural, right? So I flew up out of my chair, and I was ready to come across that table and attack Mr. Kelly and that bodyguard because I feared for my life. When you fear for your life, you go into what's called survival mode, and you will do whatever it takes to survive. Some people, they just, they faint, they pass out, because the fear is so great, the brain cannot process it, and the brain shuts down, and they faint. I don't do that. Some people, their muscles will tighten and constrict, and they start shaking and they can't move. You can be kicking them, punching them, and they won't even be trying to block the blows. They're frozen like this. That is called paralysis by fear. I don't do that either. The, a third thing people will do is to run away. That is your best option. As quickly as you can, separate yourself from the source of fear. Get away from it. Go somewhere else, all right? I would have done that had that been an option. But it was not an option for me because you cannot outrun a bullet in a motel room. I was not armed, my secretary is not armed. The only person who I knew for sure who had a weapon was the bodyguard, I could see it right here. I did not know if Mr. Kelly had a gun up under his suit jacket and tie. So the fourth option is to do what's called a preemptive strike, which means get them before they get you. And when I came up out of my chair, I was ready to dive across the table, grab the bodyguard, grab Mr. Kelly, and slam them down to the ground and take away the bodyguard's gun. So that way I neutralize the situation. It's my job to protect myself and my secretary. It's his job to protect himself and, and his clan leader, all right? 
When I hit the table, I was looking right into Mr. Kelly's eyes. I didn't say a word. My eyes were doing all the talking for me. I knew he could hear my eyes. My eyes were saying to him, what did you just do? Well, his eyes had fixated on my eyes. He didn't say a word either, but I could read his eyes. His eyes were saying to me, what did you just do? And the bodyguard had, had his hand on his gun, looking at both of us like, what did either one of y'all just do? <laughs> well, Mary, she was sitting to my left on top of the dresser because there were no more chairs. She realized what had happened and she began explaining it to us. The ice in the ice bucket next to her had begun melting and the cans of soda were falling down the ice. That was it, you know? And we all began laughing. We all began laughing at how ignorant we all were, you know? And, but it, all, it, it was a teaching moment because in that moment, we all proved ourselves to be human beings. We all felt fear. We felt fear of the unknown due to our ignorance. And then a moment later, we all felt joy, relief, because the fear was quashed. And we, 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 we breathed a sigh of relief and began laughing. Somebody almost got shot over an ice cube. That's how crazy it was, all right? But the lesson taught is this. All because some foreign, underscore, highlight, circle the word foreign, entity of which we were ignorant, that being the bucket of ice cans of soda. You know, I mean, we knew it was over there, but we, we, we'd forgotten about it. All because some foreign entity of which we were ignorant entered into our little comfort zone via the noise that it made, we became fearful of each other. The lesson taught is this. Ignorance breeds fear. We fear those things of which we are ignorant. If you do not keep that, that uh, fear in check, that fear in turn will escalate and breed hatred because we hate the things that frighten us. If you don't keep that hatred in check, that hatred will escalate and breed destruction. We want to destroy the things that we hate. Why? Because they frighten us. But guess what? At the end of the day, they may have been harmless and we were simply ignorant. So we saw the whole chain almost unravel to the last component, which would have been destruction. And it stopped just short of that, fortunately. You know, had the bodyguard pulled his gun and shot somebody, namely me or my secretary, or had I pounced across the table and attacked them and hurt one of them, just trying to protect myself and my secretary. So, but you all did see exactly what I'm talking about three and a half years ago in Charlottesville, Virginia, two hours from where I live, at the large white supremacist rally there on August 12, 2017. On that day, there was a lot of ignorance in Charlottesville. There was a lot of fear in Charlottesville. There was a lot of hatred there. And what did it culminate in? It culminated in destruction when a white supremacist got inside his vehicle and tried his best to murder as many counter protesters as he could by driving full force into the crowd. He succeeded in injuring 20 people and murdering one young lady named Heather Heyer. Ignorance breeds fear. Fear breeds hatred. Hatred breeds destruction. So, like I, so we, you know, we continued with, with the interview. Everything was fine. We laughed. We talked. You know, the ice kept doing what it was doing. And you know, now that we knew what it was, you know, we no longer feared it. And I would continue interviewing clan people all over the country. Some would talk to me, some would not talk to me, some wanted to fight with me, and all that kind of stuff. I'm just telling you about Mr. Kelly today, and just to give you a snapshot of what I do. So um, I would invite Mr. Kelly down to my house. He'd come down to my house, he'd bring his bodyguard, right? Bodyguard would sit on the couch next to him. Sometimes the bodyguard would get bored and take out his gun and twirl it on his finger like this while Mr. Kelly and I are talking. And um, this went on for about a year. And Mr. Kelly and I and the bodyguard, we'd have dinner at my table in my dining room. Now, I'm inferior, right? Yet he's inside this inferior man's house sitting at my inferior dining room table eating my inferior food, right? And so this went on for about a year. And then he began coming down to my house by himself. He trusted me that much. We'd eat at my house, we'd go out and eat, whatever. Um, during those two years, 
he never invited me to his house. After two years, he began inviting me over to his house. I'd go to his house, I would see his clan den where he'd have his meetings, I'd take pictures, take notes from my book. And then he began inviting me to clan rallies. <laughs> yeah. So I'd go to these clan rallies, you know, I'd, I'd um, I, I've been doing this for 37 years. Let, let, let's go to the next slide for a second. This one is 28 years ago. Okay, you see I'm a lot thinner. I have hair on my head, all that good stuff. This is towards the end of the rally. The fire on the cross is going out. I asked a Klansman there to pose with me. He did. I gave some other Klansmen my, my camera and took the picture. Uh, this next slide is uh, five years ago. That one was in Maryland. This one is in Missouri. Again, this is towards, towards the end of a rally. There were more people there, but, but they're over at the uh, condiment table, picnic table off to the side. And uh, that was, so it was about five years ago. What do I do with these things? Uh, next slide. I engage in conversation. I'm a firm believer that a missed opportunity for dialogue is a missed opportunity for conflict resolution. Okay, so now I'm, I'm gonna take you to one of Roger Kelly's rallies. I want you to listen to what he says. This clip was shown on CNN every hour for 24 hours all over the world. He says that even though he and I would do different things together, it did not change his views on the Klan because his views on the Klan had been cemented in his mind for years. And then he goes on to say how he believes the separation of the races. But listen to what he says about respect towards the end. Okay, we can run the uh, CNN clip, please. This is CNN. Welcome to this final hour of CNN Sunday Morning. I'm Bob Kane, and today for Miles O'Brien. Good morning to you all. I'm Joey Chun. Friendship can transcend all kinds of boundaries. Just look at us. And two men in Washington <laughs> area are showing that even an African-American man and a member of the Ku Klux Klan can find common ground. CNN's Carl Rochelle reports. Daryl Davis plays a hot piano. It's part of the show, and it makes him stand out. He also stands out here. Davis is one of the few African Americans you will ever find attending a KKK rally. More than attending, he is welcome. I got more respect for that black man than I do you white niggers All out right. there. It's been a tough day for the Klan. Their Maryland rally found many local residents rejecting the message of white separatism. After it's over, Daryl Davis hangs around backstage with his friend, Klan wizard Roger Kelly. Huh? It's not unusual for blacks and whites to be friends, but it is unusual to find a black man and a Klan leader chatting pleasantly over an orange soda after a Klan rally. The relationship started over a book Davis was writing. His secretary set up an interview with Roger Kelly, but didn't tell him Davis was black. They talked and talked some more. Davis learning about the Klan, Kelly learning about Davis. We get to know one another and we do different things, you know, it's... It hasn't changed my views about the Klan, you know, because my views on the Klan has been pretty much cemented in my mind for years. Kelly and his Klan friends go to hear Davis and his band. <laughs> and Davis goes to their rallies. I sat on, on, on the front row and, uh, and listened to each uh, Klansman speak. Um, some things I agreed with, other things I did not agree with. Davis thinks that his presence promotes badly needed understanding. Hate stems, I believe, from fear, from fear of the unknown. And I think this is all across the board, regardless of whether it's a Klansman or anything else. But he has no illusions about the Klan. If he did, his friend would be quick to disabuse them. And I believe in separation of the races. I believe that's in the best interest of all races. Does he really? Or has friendship transcended the color barrier? Listen to Kelly at a Klan rally. I'm a follow up man to hell back, because I believe in what he stands for and he believes in what I stand for. A lot of times we don't agree with everything, but at least he respects me to sit down and listen to me. And I'll respect him to sit down and listen to him. The strange relationship of a KKK wizard and his black buddy. In Washington, I'm Carl Rochelle, CNN Sunday Morning. Strange. Good adjective. Strange. Certainly that. Now you heard Roger Kelly say that even though he and I would do different things together, it did not change his views on the Klan. 
because his views on the Klan had been cemented in his mind for years. And then he went on to say how he believes in separation of the races, because he finds that to be in the best interest of all races. But did you hear the Klan leader, the Imperial Wizard, say that he respected me? What's up with that? Why is he in the Klan then? All right, I'm black, he's in the Klan, he's a Klan leader. He said he respected me. What he said was, we may not agree on everything, but at least he respects me to sit down and listen to me, and I respect him to sit down and listen to him. Those were his words. If you don't take anything else home, take those words home and use them. Understand something, I'm not a separatist, I'm not a supremacist, I'm not a nationalist or any of those ists, all right? I did not respect what Roger Kelly had to say. I respected his right to say it. You understand the difference, right? Huh? Okay, so he named three of those core values that I told you about, that everybody wants. People want to be loved. They want to be respected. They want to be heard. They want to be treated fairly. They want the same thing for their family as anybody else wants for, their fa for our family, all right? He said respect, I respected him. There's one of those values. He said I listened to him. I sat down and listened to him. I allowed him to be heard. I treated him fairly. I allowed him to talk, then I talked. That's fair. There are three core values right there. So over time, over time that cement, because I kept applying those values, that cement began to get cracks in it. He began thinking about the things that I was telling him. And then it crumbled. And then a few years back it fell apart. And guess what? Roger Kelly quit the Ku Klux Klan because he no longer believes in what he said in that, uh, in that um, what do you call it? In that uh, video clip. And when Roger Kelly quit the Klan, he gave me his robe and hood. This is the same Klan robe you saw him wearing in that uh, video clip. There it is there, okay? And of course, this is what's called the hood. This is the hood, this is the mask. Members who want anonymity, they wear this mask and peep at you through these eyelets. So they see you, you don't see them. If they don't care that their identity is revealed, the mask is attached with three snaps or Velcro. They just detach the mask and their face is exposed under the hood. And you saw both types in that video clip. You know, it bothers me a great deal as an American. We call ourselves the greatest nation on the face of this earth. Don't get me wrong, I love my country, I'm patriotic, okay? Perhaps we are the greatest technologically. We put a man on the moon. And while Neil Armstrong was up there walking around, talking about one small step for man and one giant leap for mankind, excuse me, we were able to talk with him via satellite radio phone, live from Earth all the way to the moon. We invented that technology. Everybody in here has email. You all have cell phones. Hit a few words, hit a few numbers, hit send. You're talking to people right next door in Illinois. Or, or, or on the other side of the country, California or New York, or around the world, anywhere you want to talk. We invented that technology. How is it that we Americans can talk to people anywhere on this planet and as far away as the moon, but some of us have difficulty talking to the person right next door because he or she is a different color, a different religion, a different persuasion, a different whatever. It seems to me that before we can call ourselves the greatest, maybe our ideology needs to catch up to our technology. And once we get them both up there, we can truly brag about how great we are. And listen folks, I majored in music, I'm a musician. I'm just a rock and roll piano player, all right? I did not major in sociology or psychology. But if I can do this, anybody in here can. And each one of you are the future of this country. I'm 63. By the time you all become 63, I'll be long, I'll be out of here, long gone, okay? <laughs> On my next journey, all right? So it's up to you people. And I hope this has inspired you to let you know that even as individuals, you can achieve things like this. The two CNN anchor people implied that I was strange. Well, I'll tell you what, if being strange uh, causes people to give up stuff like this, we all need to be strange. And I've got over about 60 of these things from different members. Over 200 have left. 
through conversations with me. I've got t-shirts, all kinds of stuff. So I'm gonna leave you all, I'm gonna wish you all luck in your studies and in your endeavors, and I hope you'll keep this in mind. And, what, and for the benediction, I'm gonna play a hymn. And if you, you, know, if you all know the words, uh, just a closer walk with thee. You all know that one? All right, so we're gonna do it together then. Now, I don't know how you all do it uh, in your chapel or your churches back home, but uh, this is how, how I heard it. I know, I know when I've been to, to various churches, some people sing like, just a closer walk with thee, right? But I know it like this. Have a great summer when you, when you all get done with school. I guess your finals are in a couple of weeks. You all have a great summer. And thank you all very, very much for having me. And listen, please, 
Please be sure to, to, to thank the students who brought me and your administration for, for allowing these kinds of conversations to happen. Because if you would, there are, there are a lot of campuses that won't let this kind of conversation happen on their campus. So be grateful for, the, for, for Taylor University for doing this. Thank you all.